please, uh, I would like to welcome you again on the virtual premises of the Institute for History of Medicine and Foreign Languages, which is part of the first faculty of medicine at the Charles University of Prague. My name is Tomáš Alušík and I am a member of the Institute. As some of you may know, from time to time we organize lectures where speakers talk about a broad range of topics more or less connected with the underlying theme of history of medicine. This year is no exception, although we have had to move our activities into the virtual settings. Speaking of which, I would like to ask everyone in the audience to keep your microphone muted and your cameras turned off. I don't want uh, to waste your time, so let me first thank everyone in the audience for coming here. It's nice to meet all of you. And I would also like to thank the speaker, Professor Robert Arnott. His tonight's topic is Mycenaean cult in the Hittite capital of Hattusha Bogaskei. Professor Arnott is a fellow of Green Templeton College in the University of Oxford and was educated at University College London and the University of Warwick. He is an authority on disease and medicine in the Aegean and Anatolian Bronze Age civilizations, circa 2000 to 1100 BC. Some of his latest work has also involved extraction and sequencing of ancient DNA from human skeletal remains found on Crete to determine the origins of its prehistoric population and its health. He is co-director of the post-excavation work at the late Minoan Three Necropolis of Armeni in Western Crete and is jointly responsible for its publication. In Oxford, he teaches medicine in the ancient world and is convener of the university's ancient medicine seminar. He is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society. Bob, thank you very much for inviting, uh, for accepting uh, our invitation and the microphone is yours. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, I'd like to warmly thank the Institute uh, for their kind invitation uh, for me to uh, speak to you again. Last time I, I remember it was in the, it was in the comfort of the uh, lecture theater at your, at your Institute. Um, but I'm afraid COVID-19 has put a play, paid to that. Not only that opportunity, but I might add the opportunity to drink some serious beer. However, perhaps next time. Um, some years ago, um, the eminent medical historian Vivian Nutton wrote that, and I quote, for our knowledge of Greek medicine and its physicians before the late fifth century BC, we are largely at the mercy of the combination of later legend and modern plausible speculation, and neither can be trusted entirely. This is no longer true, as it is now possible to understand how far medicine and healing existed in Greece and the Aegean before the first millennium BC, and to appreciate that the eventual establishment of healing cult, um, such as that at Epid such as that at Ep Epidorus. Now, why isn't this work? Oh, hang on. Can't get my slides to move. Oh, God. Hang on, hang on. These slides were, oh, I see. I got it, got it, got it. Such as the Sanctuary Epidorus and also the Hippocratic School of Practice must have drawn upon Bronze Age experience and traditions. Later Greek medicine was, I believe, not entirely based on early philosophy and the first principles from the first century BC onwards. Many practices and much knowledge of medicine, such as hermal remedies and some surgery, would have originated in the second millennium BC and would have been so deeply rooted that they were bound to have survived. Evidence points to much of the origins of Greek medicine, both priestly and rational, lying before 1100 BC, with Hippocratic healers having systematized a traditional body of knowledge, rather than asking fundamentally new questions. I shall start with what we know about Mycenaean healing and medicine. It is accepted that the Mycenaeans are unlikely to have differentiated between therapies based upon 
physiological techniques such as the administration of both herbal and non-organic remedies, the treatment of injured limbs and occasionally surgery with those of a purely magical uh, character. They most likely applied both types of intervention in a unified regimen of treatment. We are reminded <clears throat> that spirits or deities would have been largely considered responsible for a disease, condition or dysfunction, and invocations would have been made to healing gods to help cure them. In the Aegean, both the urban and rural economies were dominated by elites, and this would have been reflected in the better way, no better way than in the practice of medicine, which would have developed along the lines of socially constructed differential levels of practice. I believe it would have been, they would have maintained their own, I'm sorry, the Mycenaean palaces with other occupations, I believe, would have maintained their own healers in a Mycenaean palace, maintain their practice other uh, occupations and are likely to have been classified as craftsmen. Some possibly women attached to elite households practicing medicine and some surgery offering better and preferential treatment combined to others who many of whom would have largely fended for themselves. As regards our specific knowledge of medicine in the Mycenaean period in particular the little we are able to learn from the Linear B tablets, written in an early form of Greek, about healers and medicines in the Mycenaean world, is large, <coughs> largely derived from some PAMP tablets found in the Mycenaean palace of Pylos in Messenia in southwest Greece, and some additional tablets, mainly from Mycenae, such as the uh, GE series, that point to the nature of the medicines they used. The most important of the tablets are EQ, PYEQ146 and PYVN1314, dating to the period immediately before the final destruction of the palace at the end of the, um, uh, in a, at the, end of the LHCB period in approximately 1200 BC. Uh, tablet PYEQ146 forms part of a series of tablets <coughs> written mostly uh, relating to land tenure and the annual distribution of rations of seed grain. It is expressed in this way in order to indicate the size of the land holdings by, uh, by a series of individuals most likely to be palace officials, craftsmen or servants, such as perhaps the palace healer, and offers a glimpse of their status in society. Michael Brentris and John Chadwick were the first to identify from the tablets the phonetic resemblance of the word ijate to iatra. It also occurs in later Greek and Cypriot texts, but was subsequently replaced by Attic iatros. The tablet goes on to refer to the ijate as being named meno or possibly romeno. This translation has been subsequently supported by other Linear B scholars and remains to this day unchallenged. Tablet PYVN1314 refers to the word pamako or pharmacon, which is believed uh, quantifies the use of plants in a remedy. Now, regrettably, <clears throat> from what we can see in the iconography, there is no supporting pictorial evidence in the prehistoric Aegean for any form of medical practice. But the place of an ijate on the tablet is, is, is simply an indication of the existence of a healer in his social and economic, but not in his occupation context. Considering that the economic and social resources of the palaces were much greater than any other, it is only natural to assume that some healers are likely to have been dependent upon the palace in return for rations or land. If our healer who did serve the palace, then it would mirror exactly what was happening in other late Bronze Age societies at the time. 
the cuneiform records of contemporary Babylonian and Hittite medical practice, like the Linear B tablets, are records of palace-based activities with the work of the Sumerian Luazu or the Akkadian Ashu and Ashipu, largely confined to the elite. In ancient Egypt, the term Sunu, which is usually translated as a physician, probably had other meanings. And, and one who treats the ailments of the upper classes has been suggested by one scholar as being nearer the, an understanding of this role. The existence of a healer serving an earlier mainland um, ruling family is also reflected in the skeletal evidence and helps to indicate the existence of the social variation in the provision of medical practice in that period. From the very end of the Middle Helladic period, there is the skeleton of an adult female found in grave gamma of shaft grave circle B. At Mycenae and a member of one of the elite families as confirmed by the quality of the grave goods found um, with her. She had a perfectly healed mid-child three-part fracture to her right humerus without overriding of the ends or shortening of the bone. Probably resulting in a traumatic injury, it could not have healed uh, naturally in this way. In contrast, many of the occupants of, of nearby both contemporary and slightly earlier lower status uh, cemeteries, such as those at a senior learner, often present fa uh, fractures with faulty union, often in abnormal positions with consequent permanent dysfunction, which clearly not, uh, uh, did not receive any medical attention. Accordingly, in the grave from Shaft Grave Circle, be at Mycenae, there are the remains of someone of status who would have had access to better medical treatment. We also have some first millennium clues to the status of a healer as a craftsman. In Homer, the Iata, the battlefield surgeon in this case, and here's a, I'm quite sure this is, I'm quite sure this is familiar to many of you was considered as a craftsman equal to the equal to the suit such important figures such as weapon makers or armorers in the odyssey 7383 physicians are demiagoi together with carpenters soothsayers and bards in the iliad 11507 physicians like good craftsmen were eagerly sought after and worth many people the experience of healers in the late Bronze Age would have been based upon observable physical causes, much of it trauma, and they probably knew much about wounds caused by weapons, tools or accidents, and treated them accordingly. However, the causes of strokes or epilepsy, for example, would have been quite mysterious and frightening, and healers may have regarded these patients as being possessed by a spirit or demon. Whether the healers were able to go much beyond the sacrifices, spells and incantations of their time and give a natural explanation to a disease is not known. But in any case, they would have practiced with the material, materia medica at their disposal and performed minor surgery, tending the wounds and settling bone, the setting bones. An important role for the Mycenaean healer would have been to provide medical services to the warrior elites and those that serve them. Weapons that pierce the body would have been extracted, hemorrhages stopped by bandaging, wounds washed and picked clean of debris, and cranial injury treated by cranial trepanation. One of the most difficult problems facing them would have been the removal of arrowhead barbs the curse of battlefield surgery in the ancient world, and they will have been probably enlarged the wound with a knife to extract the arrow or perhaps even pushed it through uh, after removing the flight. More likely, some of the instruments used in these procedures were similar to those found in, in chamber tomb Kappa of the um, Palamedi Pranoi uh, Cemetery in Naflian in 1971, dated to the late Helladic II uh, period. 
these instruments. Uh, made from bronze together with a grinding stone and, and grinder of mortar and, uh, mortar and pestle for the pres preparation of remedies would have belonged to a healer and, and have buried, been buried with him. The close similarity of these instruments to many of those listed in a medical text from Ugaret and of the uh, same date is of interest. The Ugaret tablet includes references to forceps, scalpels, lancets, and a whetstone. Similar to what Nutton has proposed in his model of, commonly, uh, of community medicine in Greek and later Roman urban centers, there may have been both in Minoan and Mycenaean towns and larger rural communities, <clears throat> some healers outside the control of the palaces. They were probably both male and female, perhaps com competing with each other. And amongst them would have been magicians and exorcists, faith healers, bone setters, root cutters, and wise women. And some would have certainly have been above uh, not not been above conscious quackery and drug fraud. The wise woman is also a feature of Hittite medicine, whose specializations within the large family community may have included those of midwife, nurse, wet nurse, or magical uh, ritual attendant. In the Royal Archives of Atusha, there is to be identified as the Hasua, meaning the one of birth giving, she may also have been the old woman in the Hittite Old Kingdom tablets, whose uh, Old Kingdom tablets, who performed a wise variety of purification and healing rituals. The term "old" and "wise" perhaps derives from rural usage and was the exponent of a simpler form of patient care, as well as magic. Perhaps some commonly community uh, common community healers and wise women were very experienced and proficient existing at a level between the palace healers and domestic medicine and self-help and combining a mixture of folk remedies and magic some working with herbal medicine and performing ritual uh, basic surgery some community practitioners were probably barbers or smiths with particular skills perhaps tooth pulling put to everyday use. This was certainly likely later in the Iron Age. We read from the Odyssey 17381 that healers or physicians were amongst the few, uh, were amongst the few, including singers and bards, that were readily admitted to the home. However, in the rural communities, the population would have relied on self-help and fended for themselves as many of the community healers may only have been a particular feature of the late Bronze Age urban towns, although some may have been peripatetic. A series of Hittite ritual texts dating to the time of the New Kingdom which lasted from 360 to approximately 1200 BC, found in the archives of Atusha Bogoshkoi, records both questions and answers put to an oracle by divination priests in order to find the reason for the anger of the gods that caused the medical condition of King Mushalis II, who reigned from 321 to 1295 BC. It was first recorded as occurring, it was first recorded that occurring towards the start of his reign and having been brought on, sorry, I apologize, go back on that one, sorry. Um, Sorry, um, in order to find the reason for the anger of the gods that caused the medical condition of King Michelis II, first recorded as occurring towards the start 
of his reign and having been brought on during a thunderstorm. One of the symptoms seems to have been an impairment in his speech, likely caused by aphasia. This condition continued to trouble him for some years afterwards and is well documented in the Hittite texts. Aphasia is a communication disorder of previously acquired language ability that results from damage or injury to the language parts of the brain and which gets in the way of an ability to use or understand words, but does not impair a person's cognitive powers. It is usually caused by an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery or of its branches resulting in ischemic infarction or transient ischemic attack, what they call a TIA, but sometimes can be caused by cranial trauma, sometimes damage to one more part of the brain that deal with language. I believe a TIA is likely to have been the cause of the affliction. King Michilis II probably suffered from brokers or expressive aphasia caused additionally by a posterior inferior frontal lobe lesion where the person knows what he or she wants to say yet has difficulty communicating, communicating it to others. This form of aphasia may be mild or severe, but with mild aphasia, from which the kings probably initially suffered, a person may be able to converse, yet have trouble finding the right word or expressing themselves during, any, during a conversation. Hittite ritual texts, which also allow us an overview of the Hittite concept of disease with its causes and divine magic cures, show that in common with standard practice in Hittite medicine, before an illness of an elite member of society could be treated, it has to be diagnosed and the nature of the evil forces or the anger of the gods had to be understood. In the case of King Michilis II, it was believed that a thunderstorm caused the condition and it was therefore the anger of the, of the storm god that had to be assuaged. The steps that had to be taken as part of this healing process, including removing all the objects touched by the king on the day that the symptoms first manifested themselves, including the garments he wore or on an ox drawn wagon to the, uh, uh, on an offshore wagon to the town of Kumani or Hita Kumuni, which was the centre of the Anatolian king of a kingdom of Kizawatna. They were to be burned along with the wagon itself and the oxen sacrificed as an offering to the storm god. It was after a few years his condition worsened and it is the result of a further episode likely a mild stroke, that the king began to reinvestigate the cause of his condition. The text shows the steps taken by the king, and I quote, thus speaks my son Mushilis, the great king. I traveled to Kil Tilkunu, a storm burst forth, and the storm god thundered terrifyingly. I was afraid. Speech withered in my mouth, and my speech came from somewhat came somewhat haltingly. I neglected this plight entirely. But as the years followed, one after another, the cause of my plan, plight began to hound me in my sleep. And in my sleep, the God's hand fell upon me and my mouth went sideways. I consulted the oracles and the storm God of Maz Manuzia was ascertained as responsible. As has previously been pointed out, the much earlier episode is likely to have been caused by a TIA, sometimes called a mini stroke because of a, a, a temporary dysfunction to the blood to that to that part of the brain, which would have caused the aphasia. King Michilis II would then have suffered a stroke who had previously, uh, which is not uncommon for people previously suffering from a TIA. One of the symptoms of his later stroke, as we have seen, was described as to pass so pal, or my mouth went sideways, or in another translation, in my mouth voice diminished, or in my mouth began, um, uh, my mouth began crooked. 
a one-sided uh, facial uh, droop is very often a symptom of a stroke. And it has been proposed that this expression is perhaps used as in a figurative sense and means cease to function rather than a, perhaps even a special neurological condition, but a slow, slow, a slow stroke nonetheless is most likely. In his response, the king not only attempted to understand the divine wrath that brought about his worsening condition, but also called upon a number of deities to help heal him, including foreign healing deities, such as the healing gods of Achiawa and Lazpa. For the Hittites, Uh, um, with their Indo-European uh, origins, similar to that of the Mycenaeans. Medicine itself was not much advanced beyond the stage of magic and simple remedies and minor surgery, and the textual evidence for medical practice and purification found mostly in the Hattusha archives provides few systematic descriptions of rational medical practice, prescriptions or techniques. Like many early societies, magic was used to drive out disease and to restore impaired bodily function through different devices employed in the rituals, all of which were largely based on analogy. They were combined with prayers, divinations and offerings to the gods. The Hittites did little that can be considered to contribute to the progress of medical practice. Illnesses were often believed to have been the result of the malign influences of the sickness demons or as punishments sent by angry demons. Mag magic was considered to be effective as practical medicine and was applied to the sa at the same time and in many cases practical medicine was often supplemented um, or even replaced by ritual. The application of spells and the uttering of incantations and sometimes by direct appeal to a god. The effectiveness of magic was intensified by the effects of incantations and, and to understand through omens or oracular inquiry the necessary measures that would need to be employed against illness. They are also inextricably linked in the, in the, in the field of omens and divination we also see the repeat of many Mesopotamian magic usages. For example, a, a position appears in the prayer of um, Kanzuna in connection with uh, heptoposcopy, the observation of the liver of a sacred animal. There is detailed in an omen and oracle text of some considerable length found in the archives of Hedusha uh, probably to be dated a few years before 1310 BC, 11 years after the start of King Michelis' reign. This shows the king looking towards particular healing deities to treat his later stroke. It reads, in respect to the fact that the freeing of the deity of Achiawa, the deity Lazpa, and the personal deity of his majesty was indicated by Oracle as incumbent upon his man. Whether they bring the personal deity of the king, they should bring them and other deities too. And as they perform the right of them over the course of these days, it is likewise mandated for three days for the deity of Achiawa and the deity of Lazpa. And as his majesty has done obedience to the polluted and purified offerings tables and they have sacrificed in the style of Atusha should he do precisely the same for them. The healing deity of Akiawa as well as Lazpa are likely to have been the form of cult statuettes and possibly belonging to someone who had traveled in the Aegean or were the property of an emissary and were brought to help cure him. Here we are reminded of the sending on two occasions by the Mitannian king, Hushrata, of a cult statue of the goddess Ishtar to Egypt 
in an attempt to heal Pharaoh Amenhotep of his illness. We do not know which particular gods of Achiawa and Laspa were summoned. Presumably they were called upon because they had specific qualities as healing deities, which made them suitable for the purpose. It is also recorded, however, that the, Achia, uh, the Hittite court was unaware of the correct ritual that went with the Achiawa and Laspa healing deities, suggesting that the representations were not accompanied by attendants or religious healers, but the text does suggest that the sacrifices used for its deity resemble those employ, uh, employed for the household deities of the Hittite king and were familiar. Of course, the representations of the deities could have been directly summoned from overseas. However, the very fact that a healing god from Achiawa was brought to the Hittite king implies good relations between the Hittites and the Mycenaeans at this time, and also the uh, believed efficacy of Mycenaean religious medicine. However, the presence of the images of foreign deities or even the adoption of cults or traditions from overseas is not necessarily emblematic of any form of acculturation or even cultural or political influence. The finding of a Mycenaean deity does not indicate necessarily <coughs> a Mycenaean presence. But where the Mycenaean but where the Mycenaeans had contact and traded. Achiawa is an important kingdom. The name appears in 25 Hittite texts. It is often recorded. As having a king or, a, or equal status to the Hittite king. Scholars now associate the Achiawa with the Mycenaean heartland, or at least a Mycenaean polity on the eastern Aegean coast. Hittite officials would have known enough of the reputation and sacred contents of Mycenaean healing cult to send for one of the deities to benefit the ailing king. <clears throat> As regards Lesba, it has been identified with the island of Lesbos. And the healing deity that originated there must, I believe, be identified with the lesbian and northwest Anatolian pre Greek oracular deity Smintheus, much later identified with Apollo. The epithet Smintheus has been applied to Apollo, who in the Iliad could inflict play, pl plague as well as cure it. All forms of medicine fulfill a social need and the amicable coexistence of religion and practical medicine is one aspect of pluralism in later Greek medicine that, that, is, it, it, that it is speculated may have originated in the Bronze Age. For, for both the earlier Minoans on Crete and the Mycenaeans, there would have been religious and some cases magical healing for people to address their need for long-term relief of cures, perhaps internal or neurological ailments or mental illness. Priests or priestesses may have helped perform these cures, although it is likely to have been, the persist, been of a persist, personal nature, similar to the healing cult of earlier Minoan peak sanctuaries. such as Mount Trastalos, with its ex voto seeking cures or giving a thank offering for a cure. The cause of disease and the operation of remedies would have been closely linked to a religious belief in their efficacy that diseases would have been considered to be manifestations of the displeasure of deities or spirits and their own prime purpose would be to appease the deity or, 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 or exercise the spirit from the body of the sick person. There would have been in, a, would have been in use a number of religious and magical media 
including spirits and incantations. The Mycenaean healer known in the Linear B tablets as the Ijate, whilst not directly re referred to as a Ijare or a priest, may have had to associate, may have had association with a local sanctuary or some of some description. In the late Bronze Age in Egypt and the Near East, the status of a healer was enhanced by the fact that they were exchangeable commodities. However, we know nothing as to whether the Mycenaean healers were similarly exchanged. Mycenae healing cult was an integral part of Mycenaean medical practice, and it most likely originally involved a series of deities with various names and properties, including a mother goddess incorporating many aspects of nature, the goddess of vegetation, the mistress of the animals, and the household goddess. Many of these roles, often with a minor, minor ancestry, subsequently developed into other deities such as Demeter and Artemis. By the end of the 13th century BC, from the evidence of the Linear B tablets, many of the Olympian pantheon are already known and worshipped in the Mycenaean world. However, today we have a very inadequate knowledge of Mycenaean healing cult and no offerings have yet been found at a sanctuary which can directly be associated with healing, such as ex photos of human limbs and other body parts and pathologies. It may be that religious healers practice from the, from the vicinity of a town shrine, such as the... Um, Uh, cult centre at Mycenae and much of the evidence now lost. There remains, however, the problem of trying to identify our Mycenaean healing gods or God. There is evidence of the knowledge of Minoan healing deities being imported into Egypt. If one accepts the association of Keftio, as mentioned in the fragmentary London Medical Papyrus, with Crete, This papyrus contains a series of medical prescriptions and incantations which are dated to the later part of the 18th dynasty. This particular text likely being copied during the reign of Pharaoh Tutankhamun. The contents, however, are likely to be earlier and extracted from medical handbooks, thus signifying that they could have been the result of much earlier Cretan Egyptian medical contact. The papyrus contains chapters in several languages common to the Eastern Mediterranean in this time and includes two in Kiftu, or perhaps Minoan, which testifies to the knowledge of some Minoan medicine in Egypt. These are incantations for exercising a disease called the Asiatic disease, probably Belazia or even Trachoma. While much of the text is in a language other than Egyptian, they are written in Egyptian hieroglyphics in the syllabic method. Although the precise mixture over which this cantation was recited is not specified, part of it may well have been derived from plants imported or originating in the land of the Kiftu or Crete. One of ancient Egypt's regular trading partners and it suggests that incantations perhaps uttered by a priest or possibly the patient or both are likely to be formed, uh, like to be for, likely formed an important part of my own ritual medicine. The efficacy of a keftia ritual may have been psychologically more effective than the local one. The potency would have uh, lain between the individual or the priest healer who performed the implant incantation. The two parts of the London Medical Papyrus have been retranslated by Peter Haider, where he makes some important changes to previous renditions, which are very significant to the study of my known healing cult. He translates one as incantation 
of the Asiatic illness in the language of the Keftu foreign land, and another incantation of the illness, uh, Samuna, Webedi, or Webequi, illness, Sat, Sabu Hajasha, I'm sorry about this pronunciation, Humekatu, um, Lajja and Lajia, the great God. Amija, Amija, God. This sentence has to be said four times. Hydra is the view that it is now possible to identify from the sacred text two Minoan deities, which are both male and arranged hierarchically, Razaja or Razija, or Lazaja or Lazija, the great God, and Amija or Amija, the God. He believes that the deciphering of the names of two Minoan deities within a healing context, not only establishments like, establishes lightly medical relations between the two cultures, but also the importance of Minoan healing cult itself. The evidence therefore points to two healing gods, the great god Razaja and the god Ameja, to whom incantations could be made to seek a cure from the Asiatic sickness and the illness of Muna. Eric Klein supports the hypothesis that this incantation in London Medical Papyrus was created by or with the aid of a Minoan healer or physician visiting Egypt, or alternatively by an Egyptian physician who had visited Crete. There is plenty of evidence that shows Egyptian physicians being sent abroad to the Hittite court and elsewhere. However, whether these earlier um, Minoan non-Olympic pantheon healing deities were adopted by the Mycenaeans is unknown, but not impossible. There is evidence of a continuity of religious practices between the Minoans and the Mycenaeans. In Greece and the Aegean in the first millennium BC, healing as well as disease were often associated with Apollo, the father of Asclepius, although many other gods were capable of both sending and curing illnesses. May have, may have been an Anatolian connection. The male, god, the male god Apollonius was one of the three known deities of Eleusa, a northwestern Anatolian urban center, thought to be the name for the late Bronze Age city of Troy in the Troy six to seven periods. And known to the Hittites, Apollonius was probably an earlier manifestation of Apollo as a god of healing. Apollo remained very closely associated in the mythology of his son Asclepius. At Abydorus, where Asclepius is worshipped, alongside Apollo Maliatus, the sanctuary has a link with Mycenaean tradition. Hang on. At the Asclepium of Corinth, the cult of Asclepius also incorporated an earlier cult of Apollo. However, there is at present no evidence to suggest that the deity Asclepius originated in the Bronze Age. His origins are disputed, but he likely emerged around the 7th century BC, possibly in Thessaly, the cult of, um, spreading to Epidaurus and elsewhere by the beginning of the next century. It is, of course, possible that Asclepius is a much earlier form that may have been a later Bronze Age palace healer, perhaps of great skill, who after his death became a hero and then a Cretonic deity to, to be elevated to a Panhellenic, as a Panhellenic healing god by the sixth century, but that is pure speculation. Some are of the view that Apollo was not introduced into the Olympic pantheon from the ancient Near East until the Iron Age. And that, as Apollo, and that as Apollo is conspicuously absent from the Linear B text, he, he is the most he is a post Mycenaean intruder into the pantheon. Some believe that there may be evidence of Apollo in a Linear B tablet from late Mano and Nossos, <coughs> interpreting Perone on tablet uh, KNE 842 as Apollo Nai, although this is quite unconvincing. Healing was a central trait to the worship of Apollo 
only in the archaic and classical periods. And although the particular ailments of ordinary men are later attended to by Asclepius, he was the son of Apollo, who also accepted the epithet Iatris or Doctor. It may be possible to identify Paon, physician to the gods, as one of the ancient gods of healing, who could have been a healing deity sent to the uh, Hittite king Mishalis II. The name Pajawo Noe appears, for example, on tablet KNV 52, and as Paje Nijo on tablet KNFP 354, both of Nossos. Both tablets are clearly of a religious context, with tablet uh, 352 referring to offerings to Athena, Potnia, uh, Paeon, and Poseidon. However, this association cannot be made with any absolute certainty, and it is possible that Paeon was originally an independent figure and not until later associated with Apollo. It has been proposed that the, that the Linear B tablet V52 effectively establishes the Minoan mice and the analogy facts of Paeon, but it is enough to suppose that Paeon was a healing god in his own right, absorbed during the first millennium by Apollo as Apollo at Paeon. He is also the personification of the magic song, which was supposed to bring healing to a patient. We do not know whether King Mishilis II ever cure, was ever cured of his ailment by this or any other religious therapeutics, highly unlikely. However, his condition did little to undermine the, his reputation. At one, as one of the great Hittite kings and military leaders, despite what we read of epidemics during his reign. What we do know is that there is now strong evidence of religious healing in Greece and Aegean, just under a millennium before Hippocrates, with evidence of ruling elites sending healing deities or even healers from one palace to another, even overseas, certainly pointing to social economic constructed medical practices at the time, which will have continued well into the first millennium BC and beyond. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your very interesting talk. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's uh, begin uh, our discussion. Uh, please, uh, are there any questions? You can now uh, turn uh, your microphones on, also your uh, cameras. <coughs> there are still uh, 58 participants, uh, so uh, you can uh, ask uh, your question. Either you can talk uh, directly or uh, you can virtually raise your hand. Uh, it's <coughs> Malcolm Wiener in Hello, Malcolm. Uh, the States. How are you? Not um, too bad. There's some literature about the uh, Hittites uh, asking for the uh, importation of uh, a Mycenaean uh, goddess and also the sun goddess of Arena to help cure Mersili II. Have you have you looked at those? I'm not familiar with that. No. Would you? Uh, I I don't have the numbers uh, offhand at the top of my head, but I will I will look for it. And I I've, I've also uh, uh, written about this. Um, uh, in connection with uh, uh, the uh, the horrible omen of the sun yeah, of yeah. Uh, the tenth year of Mercilli the um, second, uh, which uh, uh, caused Mercilli the second to think that he'd uh, 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 displeased the sun god. Um, uh, prior to that, he was uh, uh, uncertain because there was a plague at the time. That's right, covered yeah. in tight lands, and the question was what what had caused this plague, and because of the total eclipse of the sun, on uh, I believe it was uh, June the twenty fifth, thirteen twelve B.C., uh, 
uh, were confirmed by NASA. The total eclipse of the sun over Bogoskoy at almost high noon. Uh, this convinced the Hittites that they had displeased the sun god. Um, and of course, it, uh, it provides our first absolute year date in all the Gian prehistory because that occurred in the, the uh, total eclipse of the sun occurred in 1312 in the 10th year of Mercili II. But in his third year, he stages the raid that destroys the Mycenaean colony at Miletus at Milawanda. So mm -hmm. we now know that occurred in 1319 BC. And this is the time of the third stage of the late Aladdin 3A2 pottery, which we now divide into roughly 20 year periods of early, middle and late. So that in turn helps us uh, date a, a sequence events in the Peloponnese, the destructions of Pelos and of the palace of Ias Vasilios in Laconia and at Ayos uh, Stephanos. Uh, sorry, this is a long aside, but it does <laughs> relate to the to the uh, the plague that ravaged Hittite lands. Yeah, that's right. Well, th thank you for that, Malcolm. Um, I bow to, of course, as ever, I bow to your better knowledge on the chronology, but I think that's, there's some useful points there, and I'll, I'll certainly look look into these. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll look forward very much to to hear what you come up with. Do say Thanks so much. I'll be in touch with you by email. Thanks, Malcolm. Thank you for this uh, interesting point. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are there any other questions? Uh, you can uh, raise your hand uh, virtually or uh, you can uh, start uh, asking uh, your question directly. Uh, it's Malcolm again. I should have started by saying thank you. Uh, Robert, for this uh, extremely interesting talk, which uh, from which I learned much, I look forward to staying in touch. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your participation, Dr. Wiener. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we still have uh, some time uh, and the, the discussion is uh, still open, so uh, you can ask uh, more uh, questions or you can have uh, some other points, comments. I've got pl plenty of time. I'm, I'm not expect to emerge from the study for a while yet. <laughs> have I shocked you all? Have I shocked you all in the silence? Yeah. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, if uh, there are uh, no questions. Uh, oh, blimey! Yes. I will be putting the, I will be putting an edited form of this text up on the website on a website, the, my, my college one. Um, so if people want to consult it, it will be available. And if anybody's got any questions, don't hesitate to email me. Okay, thank you for this uh, kind possibility. Uh, I would like to ask uh, for the last time, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, are there any questions or points to uh, our speaker, Professor Arnott? Okay, uh, if uh, there are uh, no uh, comments, uh, no, no more questions, uh, I would like to thank uh, to all of you uh, for uh, your participation. And uh, of course, uh, I would like to thank uh, to our speaker, Professor Robert Arnott. Bob, uh, again, it, it was a, a pleasure for uh, having you uh, tonight uh, with us. Uh, your talk was uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I wish you a, a nice evening or a, a nice uh, rest uh, of your day. And uh, I will be looking uh, forward to uh, meeting you virtually during our next uh, event uh, sometime uh, during uh, the, the following month. Thank you very much uh, for your kind participation and uh, goodbye to, to everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.